Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Skylar Hawkins, and I'm here on behalf of Start Engine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Start Engine is an SEC registered funding portal uh, through which you can raise capital for your business, most commonly and historically through equity or debt. Uh, but we've also been on the forefront of security token offerings for the past years. So I'll be talking you through a little bit about the equity crowdfunding side, as well as how it's merged with the cryptocurrency and the blockchain space, and happy to address any of your questions as we're going through the presentation. So as a starting place, and to give you just a little bit of background around the need for equity crowdfunding and why the US government has enabled it, um, there is an enormous number of small businesses here in the United States. It's really the backbone of the US economy. Uh, you can see that we're at about 430,000 new startup companies just this year alone. And in terms of who's actually creating value and jobs in the US economy, a lot of it is driven by small business owners, uh, just like yourselves uh, here in the audience. When it comes to the venture capital space, though, it is not nearly as open and amenable to these small businesses and these independent entrepreneurs that are looking to raise money based off the merit of their idea uh, versus where they might have been born or uh, you know, the color of their skin, something along those lines. The VC space today is valued at about $20 billion coming into these different startup companies. Uh, but as you can see, when you break it down by both state as well as ethnicity, it's very, very smoke focused on a niche group and privileged group of individuals. Essentially, if you do not go to Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School, you are largely locked out of the traditional funding models uh, put forward by VCs and angel investors. This has coincided with the gradual decline in the amount of value that can really be gained on the US stock market as well. Uh, the number of IPOs in the United States has continued to drop over the past 30 years. And the number of IPOs has correspondingly continued to drop, though there has been some variation there. What this means is that the everyday US investor is really locked out of the exponential value creation opportunities that are being put forth by different startup businesses. And so to address this problem and the $30 trillion sitting in stored value in the US economy, the US government passed the Jobs Act in 2012, and that law went into effect in 2015. What the Jobs Act did was that it enabled everyday business owners such as yourselves to raise money from the general US and international population, as opposed to it being very restricted to a specific group of individuals. Um, many of you may be familiar with the term accredited investor. For those of you who are not, an accredited investor he, here in the United States is a very wealthy individual, uh, someone that has over $1 million in liquid net assets or has hit certain income thresholds, such as $200,000 made in back-to-back -back years. This line of demarcation for an accredited investor enables them by US law to invest in these different startup businesses under an old government guideline called Reg D 506 C. This um, is essentially only for them. A U everyday US investor could not get access to the early Facebook or the early Snapchat or some of these businesses that are being created. This is no longer the case. Uh, through the Jobs Act, you can now raise money from the everyday population and the marketplace, which began in 2015 with the implementation of the law, is exploding. Uh, it's well over a billion dollars. I believe it is now over $2 billion. And if you're looking to do a fundraise like this, the largest player in the space is right down the street from you. Uh, Start Engine Capital, we're located at the Pacific Design Center over in West Hollywood. And in terms of number of companies launched, as well, I believe, in dollars raised, Start Engine leads the race. Our primary competitors are WeFunder and SeedInvest. Though the market is growing so quickly, you really can't go wrong. If you're looking to raise capital, this is an excellent method to do so, and it's very new and novel. A lot of people do not know this exists and are not taking advantage of it. Now, the birth of equity crowdfunding in the Jobs Act coincided with the rise of ICOs as well. And while this has dipped some with the decline in Bitcoin prices and other cryptocurrency prices, you can still see that the ICO marketplace is on par with the amount of money that VCs have been putting into startup companies historically. It's a massive market opportunity and essentially doubles the amount of money that was there historically that you could get access to as an entrepreneur. To give just a little bit of background, I apologize, some of these slides uh, won't display perfectly correctly, we noticed uh, on the presentation. But to give you just a brief background on the ICO space, it really came to, um, into effect in 2009 when the very mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto uh, launched Bitcoin and the blockchain, blockchain technology that enabled black, or Bitcoin to exist. 
Uh, this went through in variability, but really took a major step forward in 2014 when the Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin proposed Ethereum and conducted what many view as the first successful ICO raise. They brought in about $18 million to fund the effort. And Ethereum, you've heard uh, Curtis and Blake reference smart contracts. Uh, that's really Ethereum's claim to fame, is that they have that smart contract capability built into their platform. This led to an exponential increase in the number of ICOs. We saw the marketplace take off. But in May 2016, we saw that there are some stumbling blocks and some issues. Uh, this was most on display with the failure of the Dow ICO. They raised about $50 million via cryptocurrencies, only to have it vanish, essentially, overnight. Every investor that put money in lost that money. And this exposed the need for two things. First, investor protections. Um, these tokens are often not referred to as securities, but as we're seeing, the SEC is cracking down on the space, and many of them are. And so we saw the need for investor protections, and we also saw the need for regulation in the space uh, to bring these ICOs into compliance with the SEC rules. Yes, why, go ahead. Why did the money disappear? Uh, it was hacked on the blockchain. I'd have to go back to read the specific scenario. Um, Curtis, you may know off the top of your head how the hack was actually conducted. Um, so the DAO was actually, it was uh, one of the, it was a really cool when they first came out with it. It was um, so that everyone could kind of, that the crowd would decide which um, companies they were going to invest in in public markets. And um, so it was, it was executed on smart contracts using Ethereum. And so um, the, like, I don't need to know the technical details on how the hack actually happened, but they ended up stealing essentially um, 50 million in, um, in cryptocurrency and Ethereum from, um, through the execution of the DAO. Um, it was the first, one of the first ones where the SEC really got involved, and they, it was a slap on the wrist for the DAO to say, like, yeah, we think this was a security. Um, so that was, and so they, they shut down the DAO, um, and that's why we have two new Ethereum, we have two Ethereums, because a few of the folks actually wanted to stay with that original chain, um, but Vitalik, the founder of Ethereum, split the chain and said, all right, we're actually gonna make a brand new chain. We're gonna go back a few of those blocks and pretend like this never happened. And, um, but some of the purists said, we're gonna stay with this one. We're gonna stay with the, with the current chain where all of it got stolen. And um, so there's Ethereum Classic and then there's Ethereum. So yeah, it's a little high level, I guess. Excellent, thank you. Let's see, so, so after the Dow incident, most ICO players realized that the marketplace was changing and started to take steps to bring themselves into compliance with US securities laws and the SEC. A perfect example of that would be the company T0. Uh, T0 had originally conducted their ICO on a platform called SAF Launch. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, SAF was a popular offering type for these ICOs that stood for Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. The SEC did give some guidance, though, and frowned upon the use of SAF as a non-compliant offering type. And so T0 was a great example of a firm bringing themselves into compliance. Uh, they actually switched from SAP launch to the start engine platform to finish up their Reg D 506C raise, um, and thus far are not having issues that we're seeing uh, because they have taken those steps. Other companies have not taken these steps, such as Ether Delta and Paragon Coin. And so when you're reading in the news that the SEC is doing all sorts of enforcement actions, it's for companies that have really held the course on the old way of doing things versus bringing themselves into compliance with these new security token offerings. And I'll speak more specifically about what those are in just a moment. So these are, and I apologize the slide isn't presenting quite correctly. Uh, these are the three main offering types that Start Engine works under. And the first two, of course, were enabled by the 2012 Jobs Act. Uh, to briefly recap these, because they're very pertinent to any entrepreneur in this room who's looking to raise capital. Uh, you have three main SEC guidelines that you can now utilize to bring this money in. The first and the easiest one to get started is the regulation crowdfunding guideline. Uh, we can often say Reg CF for short. You can also call it a small ICO. Whatever the case may be, it's a raise that's capped at $1,070,000, and both accredited and unaccredited investors are able to participate. So essentially, anybody who wants to raise money, if you list yourself as a regulation crowdfunding raise, they are able to do so uh, through a platform like Start Engine or someone else, such as a WeFund or a Seed Invest. This is the simplest guideline to get started under. You don't even need a lawyer and accountant to formally get the ball rolling. Uh, you can start that raise, bring in the first 107K, get that money in the bank, and keep going from there. Um, a very entrepreneur-friendly uh, raise method and raise exemption. 
Uh, the second raise exemption that we commonly see is called Regulation A+. You could also use the term large ICO. Uh, this enables you to bring in up to $50 million from both accredited and unaccredited investors. Uh, a tremendous guideline. It's often referred to as a mini IPO, so a stage that a company might go through before they list publicly on the stock market. It does come with some downsides, though, as opposed to Reg CF. And the two most pertinent ones you should be aware of is first, it takes a very long time to get a Reg A plus raise off the ground, uh, usually about three to five months, and that's because you have to be qualified by the SEC in advance. The other downside associated with Reg A plus is it's very expensive. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $100,000 to $150,000 easily for the legal and financial requirements and guidelines you're going to have to meet as part of conducting that offering. An example of that would be you would have to provide uh, audited financial books in order to conduct a Reg A+. The third offering type that we commonly utilize is Reg D 506C. Many of you in the audience may already be familiar with this guideline as it's one of the most common in the VC space. Uh, this is an uncapped amount of money that can be raised, but it can only come from that accredited investor audience. Uh, so very much in line with what you've seen historically when it comes to fundraising. Now, once these raises take place, um, well, I should say, before you jump into an actual raise type, you do have to determine the offering structure. So what are these investors getting in return for the money that they're giving you? Um, on Start Engine, historically, we really utilize four primary um, offering vehicles. You could do equity, you, could, you know, common stock, preferred stock, whatever the case may be. Uh, you could do a debt raise. It's very similar to taking out a bank loan where you have a payback period and an interest rate. Uh, you could raise money with us through a revenue share of your future sales, or you could raise money through us with a convertible note, which are all you know, very standardized historical investment mechanisms. Uh, today, though, we now can conduct STOs. And when you uh, talk with Star Engine about an STO, we really use it's really two main offering structures, so you can view it as three as well. Uh, the first one's very straightforward. Uh, think tokens as a security where the securities that you're issuing to these investors is in a tokenized form. Just think one token equals one share of stock. Um, so just tokenizing the securities that you'd be issuing to these investors anyway. The second structure that we utilize, and the one that was primarily made for utility token offerings, is called RATE. And that stands for Real Agreement for Tokens and Equity. Under this offering structure, you still do have to offer out to your investors some form of security, uh, whether it's equity or debt you can offset the amount of that security that you're issuing through the inclusion of a utility token. And um, as Curtis and Blake alluded to, a utility token primarily utilized for the internal mechanisms of running your business. Um, a lot of companies historically were just selling them outright. Um, if it's a utility token that actually holds value, you might think of it as any other product that you might sell, you know, like the coffee over there on that table. It holds inherent value and you can uh, make a purchase decision on it. Um, if you're expecting to issue utility tokens, though, and have them listed on different exchanges, things along those lines, probably going to be viewed as a security, and you're going to want to talk to your lawyer in advance about doing that. Um, actually, I should uh, mention as a quick caveat, for any ICO or STO uh, that you would conduct on the Start Engine platform, we would require that you're working with an attorney due to the amount of um, SEC um, uh, oversight that has come into the space. Uh, we, as a, an SEC-registered funding portal, cannot give you legal or financial advice, so you will absolutely want to speak with your lawyer around what you think the proper offering structure is going into this process. Let's see, so after these offerings have been constructed, uh, there's also the problem of liquidity. Uh, so what happens with these securities once they've been purchased by investors? There are some different rules that apply. Uh, under Regulation Crowdfunding and Regulation D 506C, the securities that are purchased by investors do have to be held for a one-year period. So anyone who's purchasing that, whether it's a token or whether it's a share of stock, they cannot trade that or sell it to somebody else for a one-year period. After that year period has expired, though, they can freely trade it. Uh, so think of this as an emerging stock market for small businesses that's coming into effect. Start Engine itself is building out these secondary trading platforms. Our partner that I referenced, T0, is also doing so. There's other players in the space. It is a very much uh, growing and emerging marketplace for the secondary transactions that are happening. And with Regulation A+, that mini IPO method I uh, mentioned previously, uh, there is no hold period. So the securities that are purchased are immediately tradable. Um, again, just think trading regular shares of stock, but these are really for small businesses to increase liquidity for the business owners and for the investors that support them. A lot of different uh, factors are coming into play here. Uh, at Start Engine itself, we're building out our own blockchain-based ATS to facilitate these secondary transactions and token sales that are happening. 
Uh, we operate what's called an SEC registered transfer agent as well. What that transfer agent does is it manages your cap table for you. As part of equity crowdfunding, you do tend to bring on a lot of investors. We can manage this all digitally now, and it's very, very simple to do. Uh, we uh, operate that transfer agent. It collects the investor's name, address, contact information, the number of shares they own, and so on and so forth. And that's provided to you as the entrepreneurs, uh, really for two key purposes. Uh, first and foremost, all of those folks can be plugged into your marketing mechanisms. This is a great way to turn your customers into your investors and brand ambassadors for you going forward. Uh, it's also there for meeting your reporting requirements. There's different obligations that you have going forward to these investors, depending on the SEC exemption you utilize for the raise. But especially like a regulation crowdfunding one is very, very minimal, and it's something that any entrepreneur in this room would be able to meet the requirement for.